This is a video to look at the reactions of the group 2 elements, the alkaline earth metals, and it links with Practical 19, a practical study of some group 2 elements, which is a um, regular practical used at rugby school. The three metals that we have are magnesium metal, calcium metal and barium metal. The magnesium is in the form of a powder and it is um, a grey silver metal and uh, here it has the biggest surface area of the three metals that we're going to use. The calcium has a silver grey colour as well but looks a little white um, or perhaps a light grey colour as a result of oxidation in the air and this will slow reactivity to a degree. The barium is from a source which is very old, pre-85, where the barium has been kept in oil, which relates to its reactivity. And, and this barium being so old has a very thick oxide coat and it has been cut into smaller parts from the original distribution. So let's have a look at how they react, first of all, just with a large quantity of cold water. So if we take the magnesium and put it into the cold water, very little seems to occur. If you look more closely, you may be able to see one or two bubbles forming, um, but this reaction is very, very slow. The calcium is much more reactive. Even in, these, in the form of these large granules, if we take these and put them into the water, you'll see that the reaction happens fairly quickly and bubbles of a gas are formed. It is perfectly possible to light this gas. The gas of course is hydrogen and a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen will of course um, explode and you get the squeaky pop but the reaction is rapid and there the hydrogen is actually burning As the calcium reacts vigorously, we can see that the hydrogen gas is, is burning very nicely at the surface and the solution is becoming cloudy. The product, calcium hydroxide, is not very soluble in water and remains as a white suspension once some of the calcium hydroxide has dissolved. We'll come back to that in a second. The barium, on the other hand, needs um, a little bit of uh, cleaning before we place it, try and get rid of as much oil as possible. So take this larger piece here and we clean the, the barium of its oil and we see how it works with the cold water. Definitely sinks and there is a reaction. There is a reaction, quite rapid, but at the moment the surface coat is preventing that from becoming a vigorous reaction. But quickly the surface coat disappears and the reaction is starting to become more and more vigorous. And once again the gas is hydrogen gas. Now it becomes cloudy in part here because of the oil in which the, the barium was kept. And it's not always easy to prove the, um, the hydrogen from this particular um, reaction. So, in order to perhaps make that a little clearer, we will just add the barium, another piece of barium, perhaps to a smaller quantity of water and just do the, the hydrogen test. So what I'm going to do here is just add a bit of barium into a test tube of water. 
just leave that a few seconds to get it to um, go rapidly. Once the reaction takes off, which you can see it is going very rapidly now, I can just do a squeaky pop test on this. And of course, you get the positive result from that reaction. So hydrogen is confirmed for the calcium and for the barium, although there may be the sign of some gas rising here, but it wouldn't be sufficient for us to be able to test for hydrogen. But we can test to see if the solution is the group two hydroxide. So we're going to use universal indicator. Universal indicator at the moment is um, not blue. And we're going to just use this and add it to the barium solution to see what happens. And we get a very dark blue color forming to the calcium with water solution, dark blue again. And to see if there's any sign of magnesium forming an alkaline solution, we will add some in there. Much less convincing. So if we look at the magnesium, you can see that at present, maybe a sign that it's gone very slightly bluer in color. But in a general sense, that is definitely not, whereas these two have definitely formed blue colorations and we have alkaline solutions. Now, in order to encourage the, the magnesium perhaps to uh, react a bit more rapidly, it suggests in the instructions that you set it up in hot water. So we'll set this up but it needs to be left for some time. The reaction of magnesium, the reaction of magnesium with steam can be seen on another video available on the Rugby School uh, YouTube site. So this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to, this is hotter water, and I'm going to trap the magnesium in a little package. I'm going to place some magnesium into a little package here. A fair bit of magnesium powder, good surface area, so we might be able to get a reaction over a period of time. And then just turn that into a little package of uh, magnesium surrounded by the filter paper. I'm going to use a filter funnel and just drop that into the warmer water. To see whether or not hydrogen gas is going to be produced over a lengthy period of time, the apparatus is set up so that an inverted tube is placed over the top, and so any gas produced will be collected into the, into the tube. So, no immediate results from this, but this is now hot water with the powdered magnesium. And we can leave this for perhaps um, six or seven hours and see if any of the hydrogen gas has collected the top. So we'll have a look at that next time. So here is the reaction and it has been left for about 12 hours. Um, there is plenty of hydrogen in the tube and if you look very closely um, at the bottom you can see that there are uh, some gas bubbles still being produced um, of the hydrogen gas that's coming from the, uh, the magnesium. Um, to show that it is um, hydrogen gas, uh, obviously if this is pure hydrogen gas then we might find that the um, the hydrogen burns rather than gives the squeaky pop. So we will try this um, quickly and see what we get. It may give a burn or a squeaky pop. And in fact, the squeaky pop. We got the squeaky pop from this one. Okay, proof that hydrogen gas is produced from this reaction. This is a video 
to look at the acid-base character of the oxides and hydroxides of group 2 elements. It links with experiment 2 from practical 19, a practical study of some group 2 elements, a practical that is frequently done at rugby school in the lower sixth. Very, very small quantities of each of the oxides or hydroxides are added to about 10 cm cubed of water. They are mixed and some universal indicator is added and the pH of the solution is approximated by comparing with a chart. First one to add is magnesium oxide. A very small quantity of magnesium oxide. Second one is calcium hydroxide. The third one is barium hydroxide. So each one is stoppered and given a good shake in order to allow the solid, if it's going to dissolve, to dissolve. No sign necessarily of solubility, there's still some particles that can be seen on the magnesium oxide, but it may have dissolved. The calcium hydroxide, that small quantity in a relatively large quantity of water, still some parts of it, so solubility still not fully soluble. Uh, the barium hydroxide, on the other hand, think pretty no sorry there is still a little bit of the barium hydroxide left so still not fully soluble okay. so to judge we'll take some universal indicator and add a few drops to each one in turn first of all to the magnesium oxide Calcium hydroxide, and finally to the barium hydroxide. Now we'll give each one a shake. Definitely has gone to a blue colour. Um, the second one, calcium hydroxide, uh, distinct blue colour too. So again, evidence of hydroxide ions in solution from both magnesium oxide and from calcium hydroxide, and uh, definitely from the barium hydroxide that seems to have the deepest blue. However, on the chart, not easy to see that perhaps that one is the greenest of the blue so perhaps only a pH of perhaps 10 or 11 distinctly bluer so perhaps a pH of around certainly 12 at least and the barium hydroxide well certainly in excess of the pH value of the calcium hydroxide so all to some degree soluble and all to some degree form aqueous hydroxide ions. This is an experiment to look at the action of heat on the hydrated chlorides of the metals of group 2. Magnesium chloride Calcium chloride and barium chloride are placed into the bottom of a test tube. 
they will be heated to see whether any hydrolysis occurs. If hydrolysis occurs, the toxic gas, hydrogen chloride, will be given off. There are several ways of testing for hydrogen chloride, but we will use the simple change that it will turn wet blue litmus red. Each one will be heated hard, and your job is to look at the speed with which any hydrogen chloride gas is produced. The fume cupboard is switched on because of the toxicity of the hydrogen chloride. So first, the magnesium chloride. Once the water of crystallization has been driven off, there is a clear hydrolysis reaction and the gas, hydrogen chloride, evolves. Secondly, calcium. Time the water of crystallization is moving more rapidly. At present, there seems to be no indication that any hydrogen fluoride gas is being given off. After vigorously heating for a very long period of time, there are the initial signs. So after considerable heating, there is definitely some hydrolysis. As can be seen from the pink coloration, Comparison of the two pieces of litmus at this stage. On the right is the magnesium chloride, on the 
left is the calcium chloride. Finally, barium chloride. Once again, you can see the effect of the water of crystallization being driven up here. Not quite so dramatic, but there is clear condensation of the water in the tube. Again, despite the strong heating, there appears to be no change in the litmus paper, and at this stage, there certainly is no hydrogen chloride gas. Unlike the other two, there appears to be no real sign of any hydrolysis. This is a video to look at the thermal stability of the group 2 carbonate, and it links with practical 19, experiment 4, which is frequently done at rugby school in the lower sixth. On heating a carbonate, it is possible that it will thermally decompose to the oxide and carbon dioxide. So on the left of this um, setup, there is some lime water to see if any carbon dioxide is collected. Each carbonate has been placed into a test tube and one at a time we will heat them hard to see whether any of any carbon dioxide is produced. magnesium carbonate. With this sometimes what happens is the gas is produced quite quickly, there's the expansion of the gas, but also the gas, because the magnesium carbonate is very powdery, the gas forms at the bottom of the tube and lifts up the powder and so it is sometimes difficult to control this reaction. Anyway, keep an eye on the lime water to see if there's any signs of carbon dioxide being formed the magnesium carbonate. You can see that reasonably rapidly thermal decomposition does appear to be happening and the gas carbon dioxide is quickly produced and the lime water turns cloudy. The second experiment is a similar job but this time with calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate this time. Again, okay, expansion of the gases. As it is heated, it's still in a powdery form, so it is possible that any carbon dioxide formed might lift the powder up. 
hasn't on this occasion. We'll try to heat the calcium carbonate hard enough to get some carbon dioxide. Clearly at this stage there seems to be very little gas being produced, which means after the initial expansion of the gases in the tube, there is very little being produced. And any gas that's being produced doesn't appear at this stage to turn the lime water cloudy. We'll keep this going for another 30 seconds or so to see if there's any sign that carbon dioxide is given up. Calcium carbonate does in fact decompose but temperatures beyond the Bunsen burner seem to be needed. That is calcium carbonate. Finally, barium carbonate. Again, there'll be initial expansion of gases. And this time on very strong heating, there appears to be no sign whatsoever of any gas being produced or indeed of carbon dioxide going into the lung water flow. Clearly there, there is no reaction for the barium carbonate. This is an experiment to look at the solubility of some group 2 compounds and the relationship between the solubility and the position in the periodic table. It is experiment 5 from Practical 19, a practical study of some Group 2 elements uh, frequently used at rugby school in the lower sixth. Soluble solutions of barium ions, calcium ions and magnesium ions have been made up by dissolving a soluble salt into distilled water. Soluble Carbonate, sulfate and hydroxide have been created by dissolving a salt, or in the case of sodium hydroxide, a base, in, into distilled water. And by mixing these solutions 
we can see any patterns that might occur in the solubility of the carbonate, sulfate and hydroxides of group 2. On mixing, if the product of the group 2 metal iron and the carbonate iron, sulfate iron or hydroxide iron are insoluble or is insoluble, then a precipitate will be seen. The thickness of the precipitate will give some indication of the solubility, but it also may indicate the relative solubilities of the sulfates, hydroxides and carbonates down the group. So these three tubes will be filled with roughly 2 cm cubed of sodium hydroxide solution these three with again roughly 2 cm cubed of the soluble sulfate solution And these three with 2 cm cubed of the carbonate solution. So, to each of the tubes, we will add magnesium, calcium, barium. Magnesium, calcium, barium. Magnesium, calcium, barium. Magnesium, calcium, and barium. So, first the hydroxides. So, the first combination is magnesium. a very dense white precipitate is formed. With calcium, roughly the same quantities, a similarly dense white precipitate is formed, indicating that both magnesium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide are significantly insoluble, with no clear pattern necessarily. And then with the barium solution, you can see that there is some precipitation, but the precipitation is much thinner than the other two. This would indicate that the hydroxides are not particularly soluble, but that solubility is certainly decreasing as you go down the group. Let's do the same with the sulfates. So we start with magnesium sulfate. Add in roughly the same quantity, and this time there is no precipitate, which would indicate that the magnesium sulfate uh, is not particularly insoluble in water. In other words, we could say that it is soluble under these conditions. Calcium sulfate, similarly no precipitate, so again no indication other than that the Calcium sulfate under these conditions appears to be soluble. And finally, barium. And again, a dense white precipitate is formed. So by the time we've moved from calcium sulfate through to barium sulfate, the solubility has changed significantly and the barium sulfate is distinctly insoluble. The carbonate iron is not necessarily one that needs to be studied, but it is of similar size, the carbonate iron, similar size and charge, the same charge as the sulfate iron. And so it's interesting to see whether we have a similar pattern with an iron which is of similar size to the um, sulfate iron. So, first of all, magnesium. And once again, 
no significant sign of a precipitate. Calcium. Oh, on this occasion, the calcium carbonate is sufficiently insoluble that we do see a precipitate, and the calcium carbonate there is clearly insoluble. And finally, if we add the barium iron to the carbonate iron, we also get a thick white PPT. Although the pattern is not perfect, it can be seen that the pattern in the hydroxides of um, the group two elements, especially on shaking, gives you a very thin PPT with the barium, whereas the other two precipitates are significant. So that seems to be a pattern where the solubility of the hydroxide is increasing. Whereas here with the sulfates, clearly these two appear to be soluble. The last one is insoluble. And here a similar pattern perhaps, where the first one appears to be soluble and then the next two are distinctly insoluble.